Good evening, everybody. If we are a ship, we are listing. So, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. We're so glad to see you on this beautiful fall evening. We're glad you've come to join with us, and for all of you online, we welcome you tonight. We're thankful that you've invited us into your home, your office, wherever you see us. What a privilege it is for us to be with you. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer, but before I do that, I have an announcement. Next Sunday night, next Sunday night, we will not be worshiping as we do here in the worship center we're having our annual fellowship Thanksgiving meal and celebration time in the fellowship hall. So next Sunday night at 5, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall, having our celebration Thanksgiving, and we pray that you will all come and join with us. And for those of you online, we also would invite you to come and join with us. We'll be meeting in the fellowship hall, good food, good fellowship and we're gathering together to give thanks. And so that's next Sunday night at 5. So we'll see you in two weeks from tonight uh, after that. Well, let's bow for a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we give you praise for who you are. We give you praise for your wonderful grace to us. We give you praise for all that you do in our lives, many things which perhaps we're not aware of at this moment, but we will be. And we, we just thank you that you are always there with us. And now as we've gathered together in this place, we want to worship you, sing your praises, lift up your name on high, enjoy fellowship together as your family, O oh God. So lead us, we pray, and we thank you, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Pastor Jared. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see everybody tonight. Just a reminder that next week's uh, Thanksgiving, giving thanks, it's a potluck. So bring food to share. And there's a, a flyer in the bulletin. If you didn't get one this morning, you can grab one. It'll tell you exactly what you're supposed to bring for that. We're going to have a great time sharing together. Um, I'm going to begin with a word from Proverbs chapter 14, verse 20 through 22. It says this, the poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. Whoever despises his neighbor, though, is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. And that's the kind of people we want to be. Let's ask the Lord to add his blessing to the reading of his word and have Neville come and lead us in worship. We have a good song to lead off tonight, uh, 503. Since Jesus came into my heart, what a change that's come into our lives since Jesus came into our lives. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul, which for long I had sought, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, what a joy for my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart, and my sins, which were many, are all washed away. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, but of joy of my soul, like the sea below, since Jesus came. 
came into my heart. And he asks us to trust and obey because as we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he shouts on our way. 571. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. 605. Alone. 
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, if you have not had the chance uh, to pick up the new calendar for this month, it's still in the back. And uh, I just want to confess with you, this is a little difficult, because every time I think about it, I start to cry. So I'm going to try to get through it. Um, this feature for this week is about women who has been persecuted. Open Doors did a research a year ago about gender-related persecution. And women are two or three times more vulnerable. Let me tell you the good news, so I won't lose it, and then I'll tell you how they're being persecuted. Uh, there are programs that help women with literacy and trauma recovery, as well as uh, teaching them and training them in using their skill. Now, according to uh, Helen Fisher, who is the uh, global uh, gender persecution specialist, she shared that a typical uh, occurrence would be that a militia would come into the village, Christian village, drag out the family, torture and kill the men, the young boy, and leave the women. They rape the women and the older girls while the younger children watched. She said that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is when these women are trying to pick up the pieces. They're being looked upon as adulterous and unclean. So if they were managed to make any type of living within that area, the community would not buy from them because they were from the hands of people. They looked upon as unclean. Last week, we've learned from Dad about the Samaritan. And, and I love that the word compassion was shared with us is that is to suffer with. And so I want to pray from 2 Corinthians, which uh, Dad, uh, Pastor Raj also shared with us last week. 2 Corinthians 5.20 said, For the sake of him who knew, for the sake, for our sake, pardon me, for our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sinful, so that in him we might have the righteousness of Christ, and let's pray for these women. Oh, before I forget, I, you can watch a short video on this report um, if you look up gender related from Open Doors, and it's about a few minutes, but it's very powerful. And the other thing that um, uh, Helen Fisher connected this uh, women persecution, it's impact the growth of the church. So as a church minister to these women, the church itself grow. And so, um, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your compassion that you sent your son who is sinless, pure, holy, and blameless to be made sinful for us. That in him, we have the righteousness, the right standing, the right relationship with Christ. And I thank you that these women who have been traumatized, these young girls that have been traumatized can be new creation in Christ Jesus. And so I do ask in Jesus' name for your Holy Spirit to come and to heal and to deliver and to mend. Those broken places cannot be made right by man, but God, you can make all things right. It says in your word that in your time, all things are made beautiful. And so we are asking that you use these ones as a powerful testimony for your glory, the power to redeem in the blood, the power to love and forgive in the blood, for these women as they are being made whole. Father, may the church has a greater testimony than the, the, the story of atrocity against them, Lord. I pray for the growth and the, the provision for these programs that minister to women who've been persecuted specifically. I pray that you provide and that you also, Lord, Bring those alongside to walk with these ones in their long journey back to recovery. And Abba, Father, so often the church in the West are so disconnected with the suffering of our brother and sister. I, I'm asking that you awaken us today to see this could be our sister. This could be your, be your mother. 
that are in this pain. But in you, I thank you that there is hope, and the blessed hope is that Jesus Christ is in sinner. So thank you, Jesus, for coming and suffer for us. And in you, we have wholeness and healing and peace with you and with all those around us. So we praise you and we thank you for working in these women powerfully. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. Would you turn in your, in your hymn books to page 214? 
214, and we're going to sing what they just played. Wasn't that wonderful? He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. Let's sing it together. Well, enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. Will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen, amen. Now I want you to do something before we come to God's word tonight. We can't get up and go all around. We'll do that next week. But will you greet the people around you tonight and let them know how glad you are they're here? We wouldn't want anybody to come in our midst and say, those people did not greet me. They weren't friendly. We would never want that said, would we? Never, never, never. We're so thankful to have everybody here, and we just uh, rejoice at your presence. We rejoice at your fellowship and what a privilege it is for us to be together tonight. I would like to have you take you, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Back in the 80s and 1990s, there was an expression which caught on, uh, at least in Southern California. I have a feeling it caught on across America. And the expression said this, he with the most toys wins. Do you remember that? He who has the most toys wins. He who died with the most toys wins? That, I don't know. I, uh, I heard he with the most toys wins. Either way, here's the thought. He who lives or dies with the most toys doesn't win. He didn't win then, he doesn't win now, and he never will win <laughs> because there's a whole lot more to this life than toys. And as we look into our uh, parable tonight, we're going to see that because there was a man who had a great deal of toys. He had everything that money could buy, and yet he realized too late that he didn't have what he needed. We're going to look tonight at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, a powerful, powerful parable which the Lord Jesus gives to us in, uh, in Luke chapter 16. We as we look at this parable tonight, we want to see from Jesus' point of view what truly is important. And when you think about it, there's only one point of view that really matters, and that's his. When you think of eternity, when you think of living a life that counts, it's the view of the Lord Jesus Christ which matters to us. And so now would you please look with me, Luke chapter 16. And I'm beginning to read at verse 19. We'll go through the parable, but I'll start with just a few verses right now. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, 
who desires to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight with a powerful parable from your holy word. We're going to look at two men. One man apparently had it all. The other man had nothing. He didn't even have his health. He had no place to live. He was more than a beggar. He was just cast aside. And so, Heavenly Father, as we look at these two lives, we're going to see from your point of view what really is important and how we who have so much have the privilege of being uh, an arm of yours to minister to others and to share with them in grace, in kindness, but most of all, who you are, so that they are prepared to enter into eternity. So, Heavenly Father, we humbly ask you tonight, minister your word through the powerful presence of your Holy Spirit. And we humbly ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. What a stark contrast we see as we view the lives of these two men. And as we consider their lives, my first point tonight is this. Outward circumstances do not often relate the true experience of one's life. Let me share that again. Outward circumstances do not often relate the true experience of one's life. As you look at this parable, the rich man had everything and the poor man had absolutely nothing. But we're going to see as we work through the parable that this poor man had wealth untold. And he had wealth untold because he had a right relationship with God. Now, the question has been asked, are the two men in this story real, or is this truly what we call a parable? If it is a parable, this is the only parable told by the Lord Jesus where one of the characters has been named. So many have taken because of that that this might actually have been a real happening rather than just a story with a deep spiritual meaning. Either way, the Lord Jesus employs this story to get across a lesson to the Pharisees, something that they needed to learn. You see, the Lord Jesus, just before he goes to the cross, he spends these last days ministering to the religious leaders of Israel. They have formed themselves against him. They do not like him. They do not believe in him. They are trying to keep people from, from believing in him. And so they, they have this advanced learning. They have this personal wealth. They have the important places in the nation of Israel. And they think because of who they are and what they've done that they have a right relationship with God. And yet so many of them, not all of them, but so many of them were far away from God. And so now the Lord Jesus comes to them with a parable. A parable that if, <clears throat> if their hearts are open, if their minds are open to what he is saying to them, they should be convicted down to the very core of their being that they have great need in their life. You know, oftentimes we go through life and we go through life glibly and we don't think that we have great needs in our lives, great spiritual needs, but we all do. And thankfully, there is that one who meets all of those needs in our lives, and his name is Jesus. Aren't you glad? Amen. We are glad. Now, the rich man in this parable reminds us of these Jewish religious leaders, these Pharisees. He reminds us of them in several ways. And a few verses back in Luke 16, at verse 13, we see how they remind us of this man. Would you look at Luke 16, 13, please? Jesus is speaking, and he says this, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Now notice, the Pharisees who were what? Lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, 
You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. I could not get away from those words. God knows your hearts. You and I realize tonight that God knows our hearts. He knows all about us. He knows what we think. He knows our desires. Well, as God knows this hearts and the wealth that this man in the parable had accumulated and the wealth that the Pharisees craved, we can see how money in and of itself could lead a person astray. That's why the Apostle Paul, as he writes to Timothy, says this about the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. These Pharisees were those who loved their money. They were those who loved the the, uh, salutations in the streets, the first seats as they went to the synagogue or to the temple, wherever they gathered together to be honored. And so the Lord Jesus brings to them a parable about a rich man, a rich man that you would think would, would kind of minister to who they are. But then over against the rich man, we have this poor man, Lazarus. Now the name Lazarus means, and this is awesome, God is my help. What a name. God is my help. Now, we don't want to confuse this Lazarus with the Lazarus of John 11, whom the Lord Jesus raised from the dead. No, they are not one and the same. Now, what else do we know of these two men? Well, first, let's look at the rich man. Our word told us tonight that the rich man's purple clothing was probably imported and colored with an expensive, with an expensive uh, item, a Tyrian dye, which sold, according to calculations, if we were to calculate money now to back then, it would have been $15 a pound, which would have been very, very expensive. This man also was, was uh, one who ate sumptuously, as God's word says. I looked up the word sumptuously. It means brilliantly. That's not from the English language, that's from the Greek. It means this man brilliantly ate from a table that was adorned with everything. This man probably lacked absolutely nothing of this world's goods. But this was not the case of the poor man Lazarus as seen in verses 20 and 21. And in verse 20 it says this, And at his gate, the rich man's gate, was laid a poor man laid Lazarus. Now, when you look in the Greek at the word laid, it really surprises you. It's not just laid as sat down. It's a word which speaks of intensity. It literally means thrown down. This man was brought and thrown down at the gate of the rich man's palace, rich man's beautiful mansion, hoping that somehow the rich man would take notice of him. And verse 21 tells us that dogs came and licked his sores. Now, there's a disagreement among expositors as to what this actually means. Let me share a few of their thoughts. Some expositors thought that by mentioning that the dogs licked his sores, that this was an insult to the man. While others said, no, this wasn't an insult. Dogs licked sores to promote healing. We see that amongst themselves. And so here they are licking this man's sores to bring some kind of comfort to him. The other expositors use the word even to come to this conclusion. It says that even though these animals, though having no moral obligation to help this dear man, showed far more concern for him than the rich man at whose gate he was dropped every day. So many, and I go along with them, believe that the Lord Jesus included this this, this thought of the dogs licking this man's sore to show that even an inanimate object, an an animal who has no moral obligation to minister to, to any human was showing more compassion towards this poor man than the rich man. 
And of course, he's hoping that as he is ministering this word to the Pharisees, that maybe the light is turning on in their mind, and maybe they're wondering to themselves, do I show compassion to others as I come into contact with them? We're going to build on this theme as we go along. But then, if he did see this situation, the rich man, if he saw this poor man that was dropped at his gate every day, why wasn't he moved to action? Why didn't he go and help this dear man? Verse 21 told us that the poor man desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Now, interestingly, if you've read your Gospels, you realize that in Matthew 15, 27, while Jesus is ministering to the Canaanite woman who's come because her daughter is possessed and she wants the Lord Jesus to heal her, he tells her that those who eat at the table should be, should be helped first, meaning the Jews. But then she says, as a non-Jew, but don't the crumbs that fall at the puppy's feet or at the people's feet, aren't the puppies allowed to eat them? Meaning, aren't we who are not Jews but are like household puppies able to eat the food that's dropped at the feet? Can we not also participate in the healing in what you do for others? Can you not do for us as well? And the Lord Jesus understood what she was saying, that she had faith in him. And he says, yes, go away. Your daughter has been healed. So crumbs were dropped at the feet of the tables, and the animals would eat them. And this dear man longed to have something, something that even a house pet could have to eat. So we asked the question, was there not enough to spare with this poor man? The obvious answer is yes, there was plenty to spare. These two men were very different in many ways. And even though Lazarus suffered greatly, we know this about him, and we're going to learn about it even more in a moment. Lazarus continued to trust God in spite of the difficulty he had in his life. My friends, aren't you glad that you and I, like Lazarus, have hope in God? You know, we come into this place every Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night, we don't know what you are going through. We don't know the trials that you face. We don't know the temptations. We don't know the sorrows that you carry. And sometimes we wonder, Lord, I need hope, but I'm not finding it. Where is it? Praise God, our hope is in Jesus. In Matthew 5, 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. This poor rich man, rich as he was, missed out on receiving what others had received because he was not merciful to this poor man who was dropped at his gate. Well, in, as we look further into this parable, we see that the rich man and the Lazarus are now are coming upon a different phase of their life, a phase which every man will come to. Would you look with me, please, verse 22 of Luke chapter 16. The poor man, what? Died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. Yes, 
As we look at this parable now, we see that something new has been introduced. Where would these two men spend eternity? The rich man seemed to have everything in this life. And I wonder if this man thought, I will never, never be without this. I will continue to have this richness all of my life. And then you wonder if the poor man is thinking to himself, when, when will this sorrow of mine ever end? But we realize that all men, all men die. In Hebrews 9, verse 27, God's word tells us, And just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes the judgment. From the very moment of each man's death, we see a significance in their passing away. Verse 22 tells us that Lazarus's passing was accompanied by comfort. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Well, notice how it depicts how the rich man died. The rich man also died and was what? Just buried. In this parable, the Lord Jesus says nothing overtly about the spiritual condition of, of either man, but the fact that Lazarus is carried by angels to feast with Abraham implies strongly that he is right with God, whereas the rich man's torment in Hades, and I'll describe what Hades is in a moment, shows that he is not right with God. So though the rich man had it all here, on earth, it's, it's Lazarus who has the joy and the true spiritual wealth that lasts for all eternity. We must remember the context of our passage as we preach each week. The Lord Jesus as a Jew is ministering to the nation of Israel. He's ministering to the religious leaders of Israel, these, these Pharisees. Again, they base their walk with God on who they were and what they did and how they, according to their own estimation, were obeying the law which he gave them, which many times they weren't. They substituted their own rules and regulations for the law which God had given. Now, the importance about Abraham being mentioned is that Abraham is the friend of God. He's the physical father of the Jewish nation. And Abraham's side, or Abraham's bosom, which is found only here in Scripture, was used in, in the Talmud as a figure for heaven. The Talmud is the central text of rabbinic Judaism and the primary source of Jewish religious law. So as the Lord Jesus is teaching this parable to them, he's using things that they can identify with from their law. The idea expressed here was that Lazarus was given a place of high honor reclining next to Abraham at the heavenly banquet, something which these rabbis would have said, oh, no, that would never happen. There would never be anybody so poor and so wretched that could find favor with God, let alone go to heaven and sit at the side of our father Abraham. Now, Lazarus was not accorded this honor because he was poor. Some people would say, well, God looks at the poor, and so God gave him this glorious place in heaven because of his poorness. No, it wasn't recorded because of his poorness or him being sick or anything specially that he might have done in his life beforehand. The reason that he was accorded this place at Abraham's side was because of his personal faith relationship with God. And aren't you glad the same is true for all of us who will be ushered into God's presence when our life here on earth is through? Because of our personal faith relationship with God, we have the privilege to be with him for eternity. In Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified means to be declared righteous. Grace is the, unmer is the uh, merciful favor of God. So for all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are declared righteous 
by the unmerciful grace, by the merciful grace of God as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Well, while God's word tells us that the rich man also died and was buried, no honor, no comfort, this man just passed away. Well, we say, what, what made the difference in the destination to where these men will spend eternity? Once in Hades, one is at Abraham's bosom. Once again, Lazarus was accorded a place in heaven because of his faith relationship with Almighty God, while the rich man was in Hades being in torment. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 gives to us a powerful truth which so many in our world do not understand. And this is, this is the truth. God is speaking through Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Whereas the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts." Have you noticed that culture has a way of saying how things should spiritually take place? If a person is rich, of course they'll be accorded a place in heaven. Uh, they have earned it. They deserve it. And yet, God does not go according to culture. He goes according to his sovereign will. In thinking of culture back in the first century A.D., where Jesus is telling this parable, According to the culture in Lazarus' day, as a poor Jew, he would not have been buried in a tomb. He may not have even been placed in a potter's field, which was a place that was bought where indigents were laid who had no family, who had no way of being taken care of. They were buried in a common field. But more likely, a person in Lazarus' condition was not even buried at all. He was taken to the edge of the city and thrown on the dung heap of Gehenna where the garbage of the city was burned. According to culture, that would have been where he would have gone. Now over against this, this sorrowful event, according to the culture of the day, what about the rich man? Well, because he was rich, he most likely had the most glorious funeral known in this city. There probably was a number of people there that were there to see this dear man. Oh, I, I bet he's in heaven. He did so much down here for others. And nobody even cared one bit for Lazarus. Once again, we've learned that man's ways are not God's ways. Lazarus is comforted by Abraham which signifies heaven, while the rich man is in Hades. Well, what is meant by the word Hades? Well, Hades was the Greek term for the abode of the dead. Not a good place. In New Testament usage, Hades often refers to the place of the wicked, hell. And the word Hades, often translated hell, is used 11 times in the New Testament. It is a place, according to verse 24, according to the lips of Jesus, of conscious torment. It's not just something that's a little bit bad. Jesus said this man was in conscious torment. And what did the man do while he's in Hades? In verse 24, he calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. As we read God's word and we look at this parable and others, we realize from scripture that there are only two places that a person may spend eternity, heaven or hell. The world wants to hear of heaven, but it does not want to hear of hell. It's not politically correct to use the word hell, but it's from God himself. It is in his word. What makes the difference whether a person is in Hades or hell or in heaven? It's the decision whether or not to accept Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord. Would you, would you keep your hand here and turn to Romans 10? Romans 10, please. I want to just read a couple of verses from Romans 10. 
What makes a difference between heaven and hell is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no other. And in Romans 10, 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? You will be saved. Hallelujah. For with a heart, one believes and is justified. And with a mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him, I love this, will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, the difference that was made between those two men was that the poor man Lazarus had a right relationship with God, while the rich man did not. Now, how different were these two men? In this life, the rich man had everything, where Lazarus had absolutely nothing. Just thinking in terms of space, you know, from the gate to the front door of the mansion could have been, we don't know, 10, 20, 30 yards. Not much. But there, that man had everything. And at the gate, this dear Lazarus had absolutely nothing. Yet in eternity, everything had been flipped. And the rich man, who was so wonderful here on earth, realizes he's more than bankrupt. He has nothing because he has no relationship with God. And not only that, he is in deep, deep pain. Yet in eternity, this dear poor man, Lazarus, had everything as he was comforted by Abraham's side. Let me read verse 26 of Luke 16 again. Now Abraham says to the rich man, as he's saying, oh Abraham, you've got to, You've got, to, you've got to have this, this, this Lazarus. You've got to have him go do something for me. And Abraham says, besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. God's word makes it very clear that there's only two places to spend eternity. We realize that, heaven or hell. But it also makes very clear to us that there are no second chances to embrace Christ after death. There's no what we would call do-overs. Either we know Christ now before death and are assured of heaven, or we have rejected him now and know that we will spend eternity separated from him. How very, very sad that would be. Well, because life offers no guarantees of tomorrow, according to God's word, today is the day of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, God's word says this, We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Aren't you glad tonight that in your moment of need, when you called out to the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you embraced him as your Savior, that he helped you, that he heard you? Hallelujah, how wonderful that is that he hears the cry of the repentant sinner and how thankful we are for that. But then as we continue with the parable, we're told that the rich man in hell sadly realized too late the error of his ways, and he asked Abraham to send Lazarus on an errand. What was the errand? Would you look with me now at verse 27? And he said, Then I beg you, Father, 
to send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear, hear them. And he said, No, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Sadly, people look for the spectacular event if they're going to come to Christ. But the wonderful truth is to believe the written word of God is what he has given to us, whereby we might make that decision for him. To believe the written word of God is what he has graciously given to us. The rich man asked Abraham to send Lazarus, first of all, to give him water. Now he wants him to go on an errand to his brothers and to tell them, you don't want to come to this place. It is a place of torment. If someone rises from the dead and goes to talk to them personally, they will believe what he says, and they will not come here. But Abraham says, no, not so. You see, they have the written word of God. They have, they have Moses and the prophets from which to read. And if they will read those, those, those books from God carefully, the Old Testament scriptures, they will understand to whom they need to belong. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced. Dear family, those words speak powerfully of the single sufficiency of Scripture to overcome unbelief. If a repentant sinner will open their heart to the truth of God's Word. In Hebrews 4.12, God's Word tells us this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharpened in any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of morrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Sometimes people say, well, is Christ in the Old Testament? Is he really? <laughs> oh, yes, he is. He's in the Old Testament. Moses spoke of him. The other prophets spoke of him. There is much of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. Keep your hand here once again and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. This is a powerful prophetic passage of the Lord Jesus. So Abraham tells the men, no, you need to go, to, you need to go back to, to, to Moses and the prophets to find out how you can have a right relationship with God. Well, in Deuteronomy 18, beginning at verse 15, we have this powerful prophecy from Moses which if these Pharisees had the antennas up and their ears open and their hearts open, they should realize that the one to whom was speaking to them is the very one of whom Moses is speaking of. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. Now notice, it is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Oreb on the day of the assembly. When you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. Now notice again, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. The singular pronoun in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 15 emphasizes the ultimate prophet who was to come, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, interpret this passage as a reference 
to the coming Messiah who, like Moses, would preach divine revelation and lead God's people and the only one who could be that ultimate, ultimate prophet would be Jesus himself. Well, we have these two men. We have the rich man. We have the beggar. The rich man had everything in this life. The beggar had nothing. They die. The rich man now finds himself in hell. He is apart from God. There's no way that he can get from this place of torment to the place of comfort where Lazarus is. What made the difference? Lazarus had a right relationship with God. The rich man did not. The Lord Jesus is wanting to get something across to these Pharisees. You are those who pride yourself on your learning. You pride yourself on obeying the law. You pride yourself in doing this and do that. But if you really were the men of God, where is the love of God in your heart? Where is the, where is the pity? Where is the concern for those who are less fortunate than you? It wasn't there. He wanted them to realize that they had a lifeless religion. They had a religion of doing, but not a relationship of knowing God himself. They did not have a living faith. And as I thought of that, I thought of myself, Lord God, I'm a child of yours. It's my privilege to know you through faith in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been given all things. How am I in my life using what you have given to me? You gave to these Pharisees this wonderful privilege of being a spiritual leader in Israel. They should have had compassion on the people. They should have had a desire to lead these people to God. But that's why the Lord Jesus, in seeing what was taking place, he called out in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. The people had no rest. There was no concern on behalf of the spiritual leaders to minister to the deep, deep needs of these dear people. And I have to look inside myself, and I have to ask myself, am I like one of these Pharisees? Am I thankful for what I have been given, but I'm not looking at the needs of others? I'm not looking to minister to their needs Am I more concerned about my spiritual growth or am I concerned about the spiritual growth of others? Well, the Lord Jesus, as he spoke to these men that day, he was not talking to them necessarily about the afterlife. He wanted them to realize that living for God was more than status. It was more than than having the adulation of the people. It was a right relationship with his father. It was a right relationship with himself. It's interesting, as Jesus tells the parable, he says that even if one should rise from the dead and go and talk to the people about the truth, that they would not want to hear it. And isn't that what happened? A short time later, the Lord Jesus indeed did raise Lazarus from the grave, John 11, And they not only plotted the death of the Lord Jesus, they were plotting the death of this Lazarus as well. But sadly, the Pharisees were set in their ways, and neither Scripture nor God's Son himself could shake them loose. Why? Their hearts were not open to what God was saying through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. They ignored the teaching of God's word, Moses and the prophets, and they failed to minister to those like Lazarus who were in need. Well, I have a question for us tonight as we close. It's a question I give to myself. We talk about looking in the mirror, as Pastor Jared mentioned this morning. I look in the mirror every day. I don't like what I see. (laughs) 
when I look in the mirror. I, I tell Joyce, well, I'm going in. I'm going to see what I can do to make repairs today. And she says, the Lord be with you. No, she doesn't. <laughs> she, <laughs> she doesn't say that. She usually says, honey, I'll pray. And <laughs> but as I look at myself, I, I tend to be very critical of myself. But as I look at myself, I have to ask, Lord Jesus, am I oftentimes too much like the Pharisees rather than you? Am I so wrapped up in my own life of spiritual growth that I fail to see the needs of others, the physical needs and the spiritual needs? Am I so caught up in ministering to my own needs that I'm blinded? I'm blinded. <clears throat> you say, well, if I help somebody who's in physical need, how does that help them come to Christ? <laughs> you will never know how many people have been helped physically who then come back and ask, why did you do that? And then you have the privilege of saying, my friend, I do that because of what God has done for me. And you, there has been so, so many through the years who then have replied in so many words, then I want what you've got. Because I too want to be able to minister to others. Tonight, as we close with the parable of the poor man, this poor man and the rich man, the rich man and Lazarus, I pray that you and I will be living in such a way that we bring glory to God, that we have eyes open to the needs of others, physical needs, spiritual needs, because through them all, as we minister to them with the love of Jesus Christ and in his name, it opens the door for us to give a testimony to them of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. Just a very small example of this, and it's very small I mentioned to you this donut shop that's near Joyce's work. And uh, these last years, I've, I've sought to do small things to people that come to that donut shop to let them know of God's great love. And this is very small, but I guarantee you it spoke to people. A lady came in. And uh, we're different cultures. And she had quite an order. And Joyce and I had placed our order, her a donut and me a donut. And then as I went to pay, I says, would you please put her order on ours? I'd, I'd like to pay for it. And the lady almost fainted. She says, you what? You, you would do that for me? Oh, yes. And then the lady behind the counter made the comment you always seek to do that for others, don't you? I'm building a bridge. I'm building a bridge to let them know. And I did say, I did say, I want to help others because of what Christ has done for me. Now, that's a small thing, a small way, but we're building bridges to people. The rich man didn't build a bridge to Lazarus. He didn't even notice he was there, probably. The Pharisees were too busy looking at their own lives that they didn't see the lives of others who were in need, especially spiritually in finding God. And so tonight, as I look at my life, am I like the rich man and the Pharisee who has blinders on? Or am I like the Lord Jesus, who has my eyes wide open to minister to the needs of others 
as he places them before me. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I know you don't want to be a Pharisee. We want to be like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you tonight. We thank you for your great love for us. Lord, we know we don't deserve your love, but in your supreme mercy, you give it to us. And we thank you for the difference that you have made in our lives. We thank you that uh, you went out of your way to minister in difficult situations to people who didn't want to hear you. And it lets us know that there will be people in our lives that we will minister to who don't want to hear us. But may that not keep us away from being open to minister your love and grace to those you put in our path. The rich man didn't even stumble over poor Lazarus. He never saw him. Heavenly Father, may we be open to the needs of others. In particular, may we be open to minister to their spiritual need this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you uh, stand and sing uh, 681, 681. 681, in his time. carry that song with us this week as we go out, and uh, may we have our eyes open to those that the Lord puts in our path that we might minister in His name, in His love. Again, we remind everybody here and online, we won't be with you next Sunday night at 5. Come and join us in the Fellowship Hall where we have our Thanksgiving potluck. We trust you'll come and join with us. It's going to be a wonderful time, and I know that you would enjoy it. Until then, God bless you, dear family. We look forward to seeing you next week.